Hello, we're, we're lucky to have Professor David Wood with us today. David Wood is a professor of practice at Seton Hall University, and you are a senior researcher at the Graduate Institute in Geneva. Thank you so much for coming. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Can you first start by telling us how did you, what was your pathway as a peace builder, some of the places you've worked and, and, and the, the projects you've worked on over the years that brought you to where you are today? I think for me a very formative experience was I learned Russian um, in the, the Caucasus during the, the Second Chechen War and saw the way that the Russian public was prepared for acts of violence toward, within Chechnya during that, that military mobilization. And I was quite young at the time and it took a while for that experience to really resonate and for me to understand what had happened and once that, uh, that had occurred then I, I, I joined the, the peace building field but working initially on arms control, looking at how to reduce the flow of weapons into places of violence, then moving from that to looking at um, community safety and justice mechanisms when you have a dispute over who go governs the territory. And then from there, I, I kind of shifted focus towards the, the Middle East, founded an international peacebuilding organization that's called Peaceful Change Initiative, and really look at this complex mix of both peace processes, how aid influences peace processes, and how we can also look at wider national reconciliation beyond peace processes. We were talking off camera. You have sort of an interesting perspective on the peacebuilding field today. Tell us a little about uh, your, your views there. I suppose peace building, like any field, is quite a broad one and you have different ideas around what it means in practice. But I think we're certainly going through a bit of a generational shift in, in approaches towards peace. Um, you'll, you'll see a lot within um, United Nations documents, within those developed by, by member states, by peace organizations, this focus on the root causes of conflict. There's a sense that if we can identify what is driving people's move towards violence, then we can put in, in place measures to stop those driving factors. This works to a degree, but it also treats conflict almost like a mathematical puzzle, something that can be worked out through logic. And I'm very much of the part of the field that feels that conflict is also an emotional experience and one where we have to deal with the morals and ethics of those who go to war because you see this, this, this shift in people in conflict where they, they conduct very inhuman acts towards another person, often based upon stories around the past. And you, you have this almost disruption of people's moral compasses. And I, I think one of the key um, tasks of a peace builder is to help try and reset those moral compasses. Ultimately, everyone, when they're moving towards violence, they have to make an ethical decision to do so or not. And for us, that's what we, from, from my perspective, that's what we should be targeting, supporting people to make ethical actions so that in spite of any injustices they may have experienced within the past, they're not willing to do so. I think that brings us to your most current research. Like we said, you, you have this book, it's on the, the ethics of political commemoration. And yeah. I know the big theme throughout the book is how history plays a role in mm. conflict. And you know, you've, you've alluded to it here, but could you talk to us more about how important uh, history mm. is in conflict and give us some few examples of, of what you mean by that? Again, the, the world of peace building is expanding. I think previously, if we look back 10, 15 years, so there was this real focus on dealing with the interests of conflict parties, negotiating a solution, whether that's over who controls government or who controls land. We've shifted slightly towards understanding that we need to also protect the relationships between people, and that's, that's why we have trust building, confidence building, social cohesion work. But f from our research, there's still this absence around how to, um, to deal with conflicts where the groups in conflict have different memories, different driving ideas around what's good. So what does that mean in practice? So if you look at, say, um, tensions in the South China Seas, you might think that that is about China looking to project its interests economically, security within the South China Seas, and that's partly correct. And so you need to deal with that. At the same time, there is also a genuine belief inside Chinese society that this is their historical territory. If you look at a map that's taught within schools of the, the line. yes, exactly, or, or, of China and South China Seas, it goes very high north and it goes very high, far south. If you look at um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine at the moment, th again, you can think of that through a geopolitical lens. Russia wants to control the sufficient territory up to the, the Carpathian Mountains so that it can protect itself from future invasions because that's been the history of how Russia has been um, invaded. It could be because they're opposed to 
a movement of places like Ukraine towards European values and economic area. But it's also in Russia, they, some people genuinely believe that Ukraine is part of, of Russia. And so, yes, you have to deal with the interests. Yes, you have to build relations, but you also need to find a way of accommodating different stories about the past in a more positive manner. Could you be accused of a, of a relativist sort of uh, um, uh, justification for some parties that, mm. that, like the Russians or the Chinese yeah, yeah. Uh, who, who are, who are and, and we see it throughout time, who are uh, absolutely stitching a narrative that mm. is so far from objective reality mm. and, and unfair? Or, or do you say that everyone does this? And so, I mean, how do you deal with that sort of relativism argument? Yeah, no, it's a good question. I, th I think that the uh, approach that our research demonstrates is that we don't have the tools available to manage when groups like Russia, for example, or the leadership certainly within Russia, misuse and abuse history for their political ends. So what we're looking to do is create a framework that can, or a set of international norms that can help us better regulate how memories, how histories, especially how traumas are used in the present. So it isn't about uh, being relativist, it's about really trying to put in place the kind of norms that apply, for example, in the humanitarian sector, or when we get to trying to prevent wars, for example. And I don't think it is moralistic. So if we look at one of the crises of just the, the last month in Nagorno-Karabakh, you've seen the, the sense of injustice of the uh, Azeris over the displacement of Azerbaijanis from Nagorno-Karabakh at the end of the, the second Soviet, uh, the end of the Soviet period being used as a rationale for really um, inappropriate acts in the present. So this mass mobilization over 24 hours that we saw last week and the fear that that's generated amongst the Armenian the community. The of ethnic cleansing. Yes. Well, we're now we're seeing that 40% of the Armenian population has, of Nagorno-Karabakh has fled because they're in fear. And in social media in Azerbaijan, in the papers, there is a lot of revelry. This is a this is writing the wrongs of the past. You don't write the wrongs of the past by creating new injustices in the present. Mm. This framework that you've, that you've proposed mm -hmm. here uh, in, in the book, mm -hmm. uh, tell us about it. You, you've, you've built off the just war th principle, yeah. and the just war theory, and you're really drawing from that. So firstly, it's important to say that I've been working as part of a team, and this idea of the potential to take the just war approach and apply it to commemoration has really been led by Hans Gottbrod at Ilya State University out in Georgia in the Caucasus, um, who, has, who was the first person to try and apply this framework to commemoration and is the co-author of the, of the, the book. Um, and th really the idea is that within just the just war theory, it's an old theory um, that goes back to uh, Aquinas and others, but the idea is that we should try and make better decisions about when to start a war, and if we make that decision to start a war, how to then act within that war. And it might sound quite, um, quite loose idealistic, but the, the, the principal idea is that we should try and act in a way that is restrained and is directed in the best possible means. And that, those principles have actually integrated themselves into international norms in a way that people aren't often aware of. So for example, they're in the Geneva Convention, in international humanitarian law, in the principles and operational procedures of the international, uh, the ICRC. You know. So they're, they're there, they influence how we act in the present. The laws of war, that is. Yes, so yeah, the laws of war. Now obviously people break those laws all the time, but then we have a reference point to go back to around how they're breaching the, the, those norms. Um, and so we're trying to create the same approach, I think, within commemoration. So what is worthy of commemoration and hence how do we, and also how do we commemorate when we've decided something is worthy in a way that is restrained and is more likely to make a peaceful future possible. When it is uh, appropriate or, or legitimate to, to commemorate, uh, uh, and we're talking in a post-conflict period, commemorating one side or the other or both sides together, it, it, we can get that into the how. Yeah. But, but Give us some examples of, of when it would be uh, legitimate under this framework and when it wouldn't be, and, and maybe some real world examples from that. So when, you, when you're looking at when it's, when it's right, what is right to commemorate? What should we commemorate? We often and correctly focus on injustices and especially mass, tra mass traumas, you know, the, the displacements of people, uh, massive human rights abuses. These are things which we need to commemorate. But when we're making that decision, we've also got to bear in mind what's the intent. Are we there to hurt 
a whole group, some of whom may not have been responsible, are we there to build a better future? We need to make sure that we have people who are responsible leaders for that commemoration. So in, in just war, if you start a war, you should be able to stop it. You should have the authority, the legitimate authority to be able to stop it. And we need the same kind of legitimate authority within commemoration that people can control the outcomes of, of a commemorative act. And similarly, though, we need to be able to judge that, that it's successful. Are we likely to have success here? Um, and you can, to, to give an example, you can see in a place like Libya, for example, that after the fall of the Gaddafi period, the commemoration that was taken was one that wasn't likely to lead to a better future. The people who enacted it didn't necessarily have the legitimate authority to do so. And the cause that they selected were one of very few. So you had those people, for example, who suffered during the Gaddafi period, and then who suffered during the violence that Gaddafi brought against its people during the, um, the revolution. But equally, you have people who were supportive of the old regime, who also suffered injustices and violence, and, and whose experiences also deserve to be recognized and co commemorated. And so when the, the, the new um, revolutionary government started to commemorate, you had, you had changes in symbols. For, so for example, the Gaddafi one dinar note in which he was sat uh, like a lord on the floor was replaced by a symbol of, of young revolutionaries wearing baseball caps. For many, these young revolutionaries were the people that tore their country apart and so were very symbol of their, their insecurity in the, in, the, in the present. So it wasn't successful commemoration in that sense. It didn't help to bring people together. Mm. And there's actually a chance in Libya at the moment because national reconciliation is, the process is restarting and I, I know USIP is providing some support to that. Mm. And there's an opportunity to, to have a better form of commemoration that looks at the individual experiences of all sides. But also that commemoration isn't just about the, the symbols we put up or tear down. It's also reflected in legislation such as illustration. That for me is an act of commemoration, equally as powerful as a memorial. How do organizations like the United States Institute of Peace mm. and others working mm. in peace building take what you've offered here and put it into practice? If you're looking at preventing violent extremism programs, for example, often people who move towards violent extremism hold these, um, these negative stories about the, the past. They have this, these mythologies of, of angels and heroes, and they're on the good side, fighting their good cause. I suppose commemoration can be brought into those attempts at preventing violent extremism to help young people understand also the suffering of the other side. So you can actually practically embed that into programs to prevent violent extremism. You can do this actually within political negotiations um, because you have to set the parameters around what is recognized within a transitional justice process, for example. So making sure that all sides, different perspectives on events are brought in, that you're not focusing on the suffering of just one group, but on a, on a, a range of, of different groups. But I, I suppose you need to be mindful that we have to understand the, the history, how it's used by political le leaders to drive violence, and put in programming to really address that, that use. Well, Professor Wood, thank you for coming to see us today. Thanks, Sandra. Thank mm -hmm. you.